So we have some other questions, um, and they usually some other questions from Discord group, and they usually pertain to reality. Is this real, or where did you get this from, or was it where was it before before Tom's Park? So I'll just read you one of them, and uh, from Merlin, he said he asks about the Black Beard's ship. Uh, was it ever a real physical ship? What was Tom's Park before Tom's Park? Um, why did the LCS, the larger consciousness system, give you ownership of the park? <laughs> so how would you respond to these questions? Who, um, from what you're saying, you're, you're almost like saying, well, these don't matter because they don't help you grow. But I'm not sure. I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah. So you answer, you, you answer Merlin. Hi, Merlin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Merlin. The answer to your question is, it doesn't matter. These things don't help you grow, just as Andy said. These things are irrelevant. They're not important. They're not significant. And they fall into a category that, that uh, I often call, uh, you know, inquiring egos want to know, you know, which is kind of a, a takeoff of a, of a advertising campaign uh, for, for uh, helping young people in school, which is called inquiring minds, you know, need to know. But so I've changed that a little, and it's inquiring egos need to know. Trying to validate it, is this real? You know, did that ship really come here and there really was a portal and all that happened and this Tom Sparks been around? Doesn't matter. That's not the point. It's here for you to experience in. That's the point. Let the rest of it go. That's just your ego wanting to, what, put it in a pigeon hole. Uh, you know, if it's, if it really is real and that ship really got there and all of that history is accurate, then that makes it different than if it doesn't. But it doesn't make it different. It's still Tom Spark. Either way, all it does is it changes your attitude toward it. But if your attitude needs to have first your intellect vet it, that it's intellectually valid, then you're missing the whole point. It needs to be intuitively valid. We're developing your intuition here. So let all that stuff go. Let all those questions go. It just is. It's there. And I've given that background because it's, it's part of being able to interact naturally there if you kind of have the sense that it's a natural place. You know, it makes it easier to go there and just naturally interact. So just take it that it is. It is just the way I describe it. It is. And it's there for you to use. And anything else is distracting and not profitable. The rest of those questions just lead you away from what's important toward things that aren't important. They're all intellectual verifications or intellectual uh, judgments on its reality. But reality is information. This is information. It's real. All of it. Use it. And as you find things that you need to change because they just don't suit you so well, change them. That Tom's Park will eventually become, you know, you, your park. I just give you a place to start. You can create things there, you know, if you want to have a canoe with a, with a sail on it because you want to, you know, go sailing in your canoe. Well, just make one, put it there. You see, and that'll be part of your park. I didn't put that in my park, but I just gave basics. And now I'm going to let the people who use the park create something themselves. And I didn't want to, I wanted to lead people to the edge of experience and never tell them what to experience. Because that way, you know, they will eventually grow into that. But if you want to try to judge it too much in the beginning, is it real? Then wrong question. Of course it's real. Use it. So, Along the same line of, is it real? Sometimes people ask, is it true? So there's this debate about non-duality. Let's, for example, <laughs> is non-duality, is that doctrine true or not true? Um, and you had this wonderful conversation with Eric 
uh, in the October fire fire mm-hmm. die chat. So, from what you're saying, sometimes whether would you say whether it is true or not true is not as important. Whether you are growing into love, yeah. exactly. Whether it's true or not true, again, is your intellect trying to judge it? Well, your intellect judging is the problem, <laughs> not the solution. So that's your intellect trying to judge its merits or judge its or you know authenticity or judge where it came from. You need to get your intellect to sit down and be quiet. This is not a game for the intellect to play. This is, you know, this is not an intellectual game. This is an intuitive game. And the is it real question is just in the way. It's not useful. You know, it won't make it any better or any worse. It's still the same Tom's part. So if it if you need to think that it's real and that the real historical Blackbeard did really go through that portal and really did leave his ship there, if you have if that is important to you for your intellect to to let go, then that's what happened. If it isn't important, then it doesn't make any difference. That's part of you, I guess, uh, customizing your Thomas Park to be the way you want. So this is, we're talking about your consciousness here. And we're talking about the intuitive side. Let the intellectual side rest. Go into Tom's Park with your intuition, connecting, connecting, have experience. It's there as a thing to have experience with. Its origin and how it got there. Well, I explain a lot of the origins of things and how they work and give names. Who did, who did what? Who invented it? You know, I have... I, I do that, and I had some fun with that because, you know, you can't be all serious about everything. You know, Thomas Park needs to be fun, too. So it's, it is a tool for them to use, not something for their intellect to decide how true it is. That's useless. It's, it's worse than useless. It, it gets you, it uses your, your attention and your focus on something that doesn't provide any value. Speaking of tool, um, one Discord uh, member asked, and his name is Mascas. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it, but that's my best pronunciation of it. He says there's a hexagon room in the, on the second floor on, of the lodge, mm-hmm. right. and he wants to use a mantra within that room. Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> That's him customizing it to be the way he wants it. Right. If that works for him, do it. And, you know, if you want to add things, you know, you can add things there. You can add another old building if you want. You know, you can you can uh, customize it to be the way you want it. This is a place your consciousness is going and making choices. If one of the choices you want to make is to is to use a, a mantra or to, to have some, some, uh, something you say, you know, some, some tool that you use, then fine, add that to it. Your consciousness, your tools, your experience. It's my part, but that's just to give you some place to start. So, Tom, um, a question comes to my mind, and that's the role that engaging with Tom's Park as a community plays. So you've made it very clear that this is a single player game and it's um, usually best just to approach it that way and not try to make it a multiplayer game or try to do it that way. And uh, with that said, um, a lot of us have found it beneficial to connect with other MBT friends. And even if we're not necessarily trying to make it a multiplayer game, we're going to the park at the same time and then sharing experiences. So Mm -hmm. could you comment on the role that this plays, not only for an individual's journey, but as a community together? Yeah, I think that is a fine thing to do. You know, go with your friends, go there and, and see. There's, you know, two ways in which you can interact there. One, you know, with your friends not necessarily with the staff that's there. Okay, the staff is there always for you to interact with. But 
if you go with a friend and you both are doing this at the same time and you see each other there, all right, now, so what does that mean? You say, oh, there's George, my friend. Hi, George, I'm over here. And then you and George go do something. You know, do something together. Do something memorable together. You know, go race each other around a jet ski track. Go hiking, you know, and, and see things. And then when you come back, talk to George and say, hey, George, this is what I saw us doing. And George can tell you what he saw the two of you doing. And there's really three, three possibilities here. One is that they don't correlate at all. No correlation between them. Well, that's okay because you had the experience and you had it with George. And that's fine. George now was a player being, being, uh, insinuated into your data stream by the larger consciousness system. And you interacted with them. Now, whether the George that's your friend, you know, the physical avatar George, whether he's aware of that or not, doesn't matter. That was, that was George as played by the LCS. Well, George is actually played by the LCS. That's, that's what it means to be an avatar, is that you're played by consciousness, right? So, you know, whether or not your friend George has that in his memory or not, or whether you have what George thought you and he did in your memory or not, really isn't important. Okay. Now, the system will play George just as it plays George being George. So the system is playing George as George. George is an avatar. The system is consciousness. So there's consciousness playing George. And now in Tom's Park, there's still consciousness playing George. And whether both of those representations of George have the same memory or not isn't important. All kinds of things happen in our minds that we don't remember. Many people don't remember dreams very well. They just get bits and pieces of them. You know, so there's lots of things can happen to us that drop out of our memory or never even get into our memory. That doesn't mean that they aren't real. They aren't significant. So that's, that's one way is that there, there's no correlation. Now, a second way is that there is correlation. You do see a lot of the same things in the same order and, and, um, some unusual things happen like George trips and falls flat on his face while he's trying to, you know, climb up a, you know, a big, uh, dead log. Something like that. So that's kind of a, a unique thing. And indeed, George may say, yeah, that's, I did. I tried that and I fell on my face. So there may be correlation then between the stories. That, co that correlation can happen two ways. One, because you're thinking of George and he's thinking of you, your consciousness, this consciousness communications may be taking place. Your consciousness is sending, you know, your thoughts to him and he's getting He's getting your thoughts. You're getting his thoughts. So you've got this consciousness to consciousness connection going on. And you indeed are getting information like that. Okay. Or the second way is that the system, for its own reasons, decides to put you in a two player game, you and George. And it's just both of you are in the same game, just like if you were both playing a multiplayer game, you know, in any other game. You're both there. You both have your free will. You're both making your choices and you both have complete memory of the experience. So those are the, you know, the, the two different ways that you can have correlation between what happens between you and George. But it's fun experiment to do. So you're playing with the structure of reality. You're playing with the things that reality can do. And we learn when we play. So I encourage people to do these things. Yes, it's generally a single player game. But if you want to play with it in other ways and make it a multiplayer game, the system may just decide to take the time because it's extra trouble for the system to make it a two player game. But it can, if it wants to do that. If it decides it's not worth the trouble, then it won't. But you can still connect mind to mind. So play with it, have fun with it. And in general, talk about it. It's good that people talk about their experiences in Tom's Park, because that leads to new ideas. Oh, you did that. 
that sounds cool. I'm going to do that too next time. You see, it it, sh- it shares. It, it lets people see and experience what other people are doing with it, which means the possibilities just grow. So it's all the possibilities that you've come across, plus the possibilities that six or seven of your friends have come across. That's a much richer set of possibilities for you to deal with. So that's good. Do talk about it and interact with others around it. And you know, whether you're doing single player or, or double player or just connected, doesn't matter. It all adds and makes the experience more rich. So, yes, all of those things. <laughs> yeah, do, them, do them all. They're all, uh, they're all significant. And I've heard you say in the past too, Tom, that when we share our experience with others, it also solidifies that experience within us. So if we are having experiences in Tom's Park that are at least fun, but maybe even useful, uh, something Mm -hmm. good for growth or learning, that sharing it with others in the community creates possibilities for them, like you were saying. And if I'm hearing right too from what you've said in the past, it also just keeps that work going in us. Ah, the learning, the fun, the integration of the Ab- park. Absolutely. It takes something that was very um, loose, perhaps, you know, an experience, just an experience. But when you put it into words and share it with somebody, that experience gets more concrete. Just the, the process of putting it into words makes you – identify things you know it it makes the whole thing a a more concrete process so it's good to put it into words and share it with other people and sometimes somebody else will say oh did you did you learn that lesson and you might say lesson what lesson well don't you know that when this and this happened that was a big lesson for you there and you may have missed the whole thing so all the ways that people can help each other when they interact are still valuable if they're interacting in Tom's Park. All those ways that interaction is a good thing is still a good thing. So, Tom, I have this question now. Last time we were together here, I played a clip for you. Um, it was from the 70s um, where you were, you were trying to transmit some message. Um, mm-hmm. that you got from the uh, non-physical reality. And you talked about how this physical reality is almost like a dream from an oversoul, right? So, and you talk about how Tom's Park is a one-player game. Are we in the one-player game right now? And the oversoul is the player? <laughs> no. We're not in a one-player game. You know, we interact with each other, and those interactions make a difference for us. It's not just us. You know, I think there's a, there's a philosophical term for that, solipism, I believe, where you are the only source of everything, and everybody is the source of their own everything. And that's not really the case because we are not independent from each other. The things that you know, that I do affect you and and what you do and your experiences and what you become and the things that you do affect me and the things your family members do affect you and the things you do affect your family members. The things you do at work affect other people at work and the boss and the boss's boss and all of those people affect you. So we constantly are challenging each other. We're constantly changing what happens. In other words, think of this, your life and what happens, you know, this minute, the next minute, the next minute, there's this big string that's, that's Andy's life, you know. Well, if the people in that string besides you, you know, did things that were different, you'd be different. You wouldn't be who you are now because you would have had to make other choices that had other consequences and you would be somebody different. You are the sum of all the choices you've made. And a lot of those choices you've made were created by other people. They weren't things you created. Those choices were created, probably most of those choices that were really meaningful were created by other people. So we're in this creative, interactive dance with people, 
Now that dance is most, you know, it, it's most meaningful to us the closer we are to those people. So our significant others, our most significant others, we may have a lot of significant others, but our most significant others are probably where we learn most about ourselves, about life, about ego, about fear, about growing up, because the, the relationship is a very developed one, a very strong one. You know each other in detail. And the people we don't know quite as well, like maybe Uncle George and, and you know, people that are, we know, and maybe they're in our family, but we're not that close to them. We learn from them too, but not like our significant other, because that significant other can twang your ego like nobody else can. They can challenge you like nobody else can, because you're interacting with them at a deeper level. You're not interacting with them with a with an image superficially. You can't maintain an image with somebody you, you live with day after day after day. That image just gets old, gets tattered, and goes down the drain. Eventually, you just are yourself. Whereas the people at work, oh, you can keep an image up. You can keep that image up with the work people all the time. With your bosses, even a different image. You know, that's easy to interact with people with your image. But the people you live with, your, your image is something you create, you know, and it's too much trouble and too hard to keep that image going all the time. It exhausts you. <laughs> and eventually you get overwhelmed with, with the exhaustion of trying to maintain it and you just act like the way you are. You're authentic. And when you're authentic, mm, that's a lot more meaningful. And your significant other people that you're authentic with, you know, they get lessons and they give you lessons because that's, that's real life. That's, that's where it really is. Fortunately, all, everybody doesn't interact with you that way. If we had 50 people that were like our significant other, we'd probably, uh, you know, burn out before we were 10 years old. But we just have a couple of significant others, you know, maybe, uh, you know, oh, uh, you know, they're maybe just our, our core family members or, or, uh, our mates or whatever, but we have a few of them and they all change us and we change them. So it can't be just, I'm Tom Campbell and I've created my own universe because my universe is very much changed by what other people do, by other people's universes. So you have all of these people. Now, each one of these people is walking around in their own reality. That's true. Each person lives in a singular reality that they have created by the way they have interpreted the data that they've received, you know, in their, since they've been aware avatars. So they create that reality. And we don't always understand each other because we're in different realities. I mean, we can see that socially. Right now, socially, we obviously have, you know, 30% of the population lives in a totally different reality, you know, than, than the 70%. And uh, some months back, it was more like 50-50. But in any case, you know, we each have individual realities. That's true. But we share our decision space. We interact with each other. And what others, how others interact with us changes us. We wouldn't be the same if we were just made it up. Matter of fact, that's why the larger conscious system had to split into a lot of, of uh, IUOCs, individuated units of consciousness, because it's just one thing is very limiting. When you're just one thing trying to make up your whole universe, you're just very limited in what you can come up with. But now you've got a bunch of other things all have free will, and you have to deal with that free will that they have, and you have to deal with their reality and their viewpoints and their needs and their wants. Now suddenly your reality is a lot more complex and has a lot more interesting ways to grow up, and it's a lot more challenging. So the system had to break apart into pieces because that creates a much richer uh, decision space, a much richer set of possibilities to, to grow into. Just one monolithic thing is going to be dull. You'll think all the thoughts you have, and then you'll 
you're done. You maybe come up with a couple of new ones every once in a while, but you know, novelty becomes harder and harder. But bring in somebody else that doesn't have your reality and the two of you interact. Well, all kinds of novelty gets gets generated on the spot. You know, in your trilogy, in your dedication, you wrote to the one, your most constant, consistent, and challenging teacher. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I did. I did. Talk about yeah. that in the context yeah. of the significant other. Well, yeah, just just what I said, you know. That's my significant other. That's Pamela, my wife. And she challenges me more more often and and more thoroughly and and you know, more difficultly than anybody else in my life and she always has and she probably always will. That's just the way it is. You know, she will challenge me in ways that nobody else would or could. And that's because we're together all the time. We're together. We have to deal with each other just as we are. There's no image. You know, we just are how we are, and we each have to deal with that. And that means that you have to get your own ego under control because, you know, your ego has to deal with her ego. And if your ego and her ego are constantly fighting with each other, well, that's dysfunctional. Well, then you got to fix that. Well, how do you fix that? Well, you can't fix her ego, so you have to fix your own. Ah, that's how she's a teacher. She teaches you that if you, you know, if, if you uh, don't want the dysfunction, you have to fix yourself. And that's what a relationship with a significant other will tell you. You know, the idea that you and your significant other will never have, uh, you know, issues or conflicts or see things different ways or would always, you know, have exactly the same thought at the same time. Of course, that doesn't happen. You and other people, you know, have to, when, you, when you're interacting with these other people in a, in a very deep way, you have to change who you are or it's not going to work. You have to get rid of that ego. You have to be willing to do it somebody else's way, not your way. Not only you have to be willing to do it, but you have to see the value in somebody else's way. It gives you a whole set of new things to learn and ways to grow. So that's why relationship is the big teacher. That's how we really learn is in relationship. And that's one of the reasons that I added so many interesting staff people in Tom's Park is because you can have a relationship with these people, a real meaningful relationship, just as meaningful and just as significant and just as real as the people you meet in this reality. It's just a different reality. So you're in a different reality frame and you meet people and those people create choices for you. And you have to, you know, deal with those choices. So that's that. Now in Tom's Park, there are not going to be as many hard and tough choices they're going to create for you because it's a kind, gentle place where everybody's nice. In this reality, it doesn't work that way. In this reality, you just get people however they are. And most of us, if you dig down deep enough, have places that aren't so nice or aren't so open and aren't so whatever. There are things about our fears, things that just get us upset or make us angry or make us feel insecure, inadequate, and then we want to go cry or we want to go mope or hide or we get angry. And all of that stuff is how you learn. And you look at it and say, yeah, I really don't like that dysfunction. And I'm the only one I can change. So what can I do about it? So, yeah, your significant other is your is usually your toughest teacher and your most effective teacher. And I don't know anybody that has ever found it any other way. I mean, that's just, that's just it. When you have a deep relationship with some other human being, they're going to change you. And they're going to give you opportunities to change yourself, I guess is a better way to say it. So, Tom, with the intention to change, there is the intellectual level and there is the being level. And mm-hmm. this is very much also uh, relevant to Tom's Park because your intention for going to Tom's Park is very important. 
is it a carnival ride or are you really going there with the intentionality to grow up? And, Mm -hmm. you know, someone like me might be like, okay, intellectually got it. But deep down, I'm still working on getting that intuitive being level intention. And so when it comes to relationships with Tom's Park, what might be, if you could speak to uh, like attitudes or tools, how to help someone like me cultivate a deeper being level intention, not just intellectually, but really from the from the heart space as a metaphor. Well, using Tom's Park as a tool, I think that will develop over time. The more time, the more minutes you put into it, the more hours you spend there, the easier that's going to be able to, you know, you're going to be able to do that. When you initially approach it, your intellect is just going to be full, all kinds of things. Like uh, Andy says, you know, is that real? You know, was the real black beard really do that? You know, and so on. And you can have all this intellectual stuff. It's just going to be there because that's the way you are. You deal with things with your intellect first because our culture's taught us that that's the right way. And besides the, you know, the uh, imagination is just junk. So you're going to approach it intellectually more in the beginning. But the more you you get involved in it, the more you interact with it, the more you make it uh, multi sensual. You know, it's it's not just hearing and seeing; it's all your senses. The more you do that, the more you kind of dissolve into the story that gets created on its own. Then the intellect is going to have fewer and fewer questions. It won't care whether Blackbeard actually did that in our history or whether it did that, w- that won't mean anything. It won't make any, you know, you'd never even think of it. You only people think of it now because they're just intellectually connected and all the, the intellect wants to ask all those questions. So I'd say just work with the park and you'll see that as time goes by, it will fly. You'll find your own reasons for going there. Even if you're not sure what they are. So just do what your intuition tells you. So, in the beginning, you may not do anything but have fun, you know, play water sports, uh, go to the gym, uh, do other things like that, you know, put on a pair of roller skates and uh, whatever, go hiking, you know, whatever it is that interests you, you know, go play table tennis or shoot pool or lots and lots of things to do there, you know, play video games, play, uh, uh, you know, VR games. There's a whole room full of just VR games up there. You, know, you can just do things that are fun. And the more you do it, the more you will drop your intellectual issues. You will strengthen your intuitive issues. And the whole thing will just take you into an intuitive space. And you will, you will kind of answer all those questions just naturally. I think that's one of the good things about Tom's Park. You don't have to figure it out. You just play and it will figure itself out as you as you play with it you may think that you're going to go there to learn this i'm going to go there to go out of body or something but if you just go there and interact with it that'll probably all change it'll probably change and you will uh, discover more of what you really want to do while you're there without your intellect trying to figure that out for you. Sometimes I feel that's a good advice for for even this life. I think a lot of days now people are trying to figure out oh, what what am I gonna do with my life? What should I do? What kind of job should I have? I'm so you know my job sucks. Um so would you give a similar advice to people who feel lost in life? Absolutely. Again, what happens in Tom's Park is not different in any significant way than what happens here. It's you in an environment dealing with other people making choices. That's the same. You know, now each environment, whether it's the Tom's Park environment or this, uh, you know, Earth environment or whatever, each environment's different and has different challenges and different things in it. But basically, yes, it's that's the same advice works both places. And I think that's going to be true of most, all the things in Tom's Park is the things you do in Tom's Park are things that you're going to start doing more of when you're in this reality. You know, as your, as your intuitive side grows there, it's going to change how you interact here. 
So the, the two will eventually not be so different. It'll just be another reality that you're interactive in, another place to learn. So yes, what, you know, our intellect tries to answer these questions. You know, what job should I have? What people should I do? You know, should I change this relationship and try for something different? Or do I need to be more this way or more that way? And we have all of these things our intellect tries to come up with answers to. And our intellect just does not have what it takes to come up with those answers. So we end up chasing our tail. We end up spinning our wheels and not knowing what to do. Because for every good reason you can think of of making this change, you can also think of a reason why you shouldn't make that change. The intellect will say, well, okay, here's the good points and here's the bad points. And you end up not knowing. So you're always frustrated. You just don't know. And when you start to go off in direction A, immediately your intellect says, well, okay, it's a risk. You're going to take it. Go for it. And then some other part of your intellect says, gee, I wonder if I should be doing this. Maybe I need to go back to B. And you start second-guessing yourself, and that's because the intellect doesn't have enough information to logically come to any conclusions. All of the information that you need to help you come to conclusions are all on the intuitive side. And you get them from the intuitive side. Well, if you're, you know, if you're very... If you have developed your intuitive side, well, you can just ask. <laughs> but if you haven't developed your intuitive side, you just go do it. You live life. And then you learn from it. And you figure that, well, every experience, I'll learn something that'll make my next experience better, my next experience more efficient, my next choice a better choice. So with that idea, there are no bad choices in the sense that go do whatever you do, but learn from it. So then if you're at B and you think maybe you ought to go back or ought to go to A and you really feel that might be a good idea, just do it. Or just don't do it, you know, but decide because you'll never have enough information to make a logical choice. It's always going to be a leap. It's always a leap of faith. No matter what you're going to do, where it is, it's never going to be, oh, the logic says this will be just like that because... It doesn't work that way. We have free will. Even the future probabilities are constantly in flux. The possibilities are constantly in flux. So rather than, than wanting to feel safe because you've thought it all out and you know this is going to be good, think of it, am I going to learn from this? Is this going to be a growing experience? Even if I learn it was a really bad choice, that will be learning. And it will make a difference. So making... Little tiny safe choices has just little tiny learning in it. Making these bigger choices has more dramatic learning involved in it. The only way you can go wrong is to not learn, is to do things and not learn anything, and then do them again and not learn anything. That's the only way you can go wrong. So if you think you need a change or, you know, a different kind of job or different kind of experience or different kind of relationship and... Think about it and say, well, where am I going to learn the most? Where's my low entropy choice? If I do this, it's going to be totally challenging and all different, and I don't know how that's going to end up. And if I do this other thing, or if I stay where I am, I know what that's going to be, and it's going to be so-so, eh, and I'm not learning a whole lot there. Well, then go. Go and stretch out. Try something new. But don't necessarily burn your bridges. You might want to go back to B. <laughs> You may not like it at A, you know, so you'd be nice to everyone and you don't hurt other people with your choices because when you're looking for that low entropy path, you have to take everybody that you interact with as part of that calculation because you affect all those people. So you look at all those people you affect and say, well, if I take this, how does it affect them? Is it going to give them new opportunities as well? And maybe that'll be a good thing. Is it going to take opportunities away from them? You know, what's it going to do? So you get your low energy path and then you just go do it and learn from it. Every relationship you have helps you be better for the next relationship. So the idea that, well, I thought this relationship was going to be, you know, the last one or the only one or something, and it's not, and then there's another, and then there's another, and then there's another. Each one of those 
relationships is making it such that the next re- relationship you can do better. So the fact that a relationship comes and goes isn't really a, a sad thing. It's a challenge. What did I learn from that? How could I be different? What do I need to do to not have the same problems I had there? And then you learn. Then you take the next one. And you learn. And you take the next one. And guess what? 20 years later, you're wise because you've learned so much from your experience. People who are old but still not wise don't learn from their experience. (laughs) As long as you learn from your experience, you'll find your wisdom. So, um, Tom, thanks so much for um, spending 90 minutes with us. I just appreciate you so much. I love you. I love your work. (laughs) Thank you so much for leading us. Um, You know, you call yourself a non-dualist, but you're special in the way that you're so human. You're perfectly human. And that's what I love so much about your work. Thank you again for being on our show. Well, you're welcome. Um, I enjoy being on the show. Uh, it's fun for me because not only do I help people by answering questions, but it's, you know, it's, it's a way for me to connect with people. I like connecting with people. You know, that's a fun thing for me to do. And I particularly like being useful to people. So it enables me to be useful. If I just sit here by myself, I'm not as useful unless I'm actually writing another book or doing something uh, like that. So these things, this, this is good for me as well. I enjoy it. I get a sense of where people's minds are, you know, what they're struggling with. It makes it easier for me to be helpful as I learn how people out there are. Um, and that's important for me to, to keep that information because I live in what most people would find a rather strange, <laughs> rather strange place most of the time. And it'd be real easy to just lose touch with the way people are and the issues they had and the problems they're struggling with. So I try to keep in touch by interacting. So I learn from this as, as well. So it helps me and it, and it helps you. But, you know, when you, you made a thing that I, I seem, I come across as human. It's, I know many times you see people who are leaders or teachers and they seem to stay up on a, kind of the ivory, you know, column that they put themselves on. But that's something they need to grow out of. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to help people. If you're condescending, it's hard to help people if you feel like, you know, you're better than they are. Because other people can feel that they feel that, you know, when they get that message and that message is not one that helps them. You know, if they feel insecure, they feel even more insecure. So if you really want to help people, then the easiest thing to do is just be who you are. And that will make you more helpful than if you try to make people look up to you or try to make people think that you're wonderful or try to make people think you have all the answers. If you do that, then you become dysfunctional. You're not helping people. Because everybody, you know, we we connect mind to mind, right? Conscious to consciousness, communications are going on all the time. And if I'm sitting up on a pedestal someplace thinking I know everything and you don't know much, you know, poor slobs, let me give them a little, you know, a little wisdom, that comes across to you. And you feel that because it's a, it's a consciousness to consciousness connection. My thoughts, my emotional feelings are out there for anybody who wants to feel them. You know, and so are yours. So they're all there and we get it. Even if we don't intellectually get it, we get it at the intuitive level. And you can't be helpful to people if you can't meet those people where they are. If you're someplace else, you know, if you're trying to be a teacher, you have to start from where your students are. If you start from where you are and say, well, I know all this stuff. and You folks have to learn all this stuff. So you're like me. That isn't helpful to anybody. You know, you have to go to where they are and help them take just one step. 
And after they've taken that one step, maybe you can help them take the next step. But, you know, they have to take the steps. You can't grab their leg and, you know, lift it up and move it forward and set it down and say, there, they took a step. You know, that doesn't work. You can't do it for them. You just, you know, so they have to do it. And you need to appreciate how hard that step was, how difficult that step was, and what they had to surmount in order to take it. That's important. That's being where they are. Instead of saying, oh, it's easy. Just do it. It's really simple. Grow up. Get rid of your fear. You know, sure, you can say those things, but it's not helpful to people to hear that. That's not on their, you know, that's not on anybody's way to, to really understanding if you say those things. I mean, you can say those, but you, you need to also say more. <laughs> you, know, you can't just say those things. You, uh, otherwise you make people feel like they've failed. Well, I'm not like that. Why I'm not I like that? Well, I guess I'm not good enough, or maybe I can't be like that. Or it's just beyond me. I couldn't do that. And then pretty soon, you've done more harm than good. You've got people thinking negative thoughts, you know, and they're going backwards. So, yeah, everybody, everybody communicates telepathically, whether we know it or not. And all these little messages and attitudes, we all know when people feel that way. And it shows. So that doesn't mean that you should be a, <laughs> that you should have a, a, a better image so that people don't notice. It just means that you should be authentic and, and be willing to share what you are and your feelings so that you don't have any secrets. You don't have any things you have to hide. You just are, and people can read it, and that's good. So that's kind of my attitude about you know interacting with people, and I do enjoy these things because I get to talk to people who are on the path, who are trying. And I get the questions from people that you know. You know, I've written in questions to you or, or friends of yours. You know, where are people, and how, what are their struggles like? And I, I want to know that because I need to say things that help people, not say things that frustrate people. Now, I'm sure I say a lot of things that frustrate people, but... I hopefully I don't just do that, that I occasionally get something that really helps someone. And, you know, the same thing that I say that really helps you, Andy, might frustrate Nathan. You know, they're not all just here's the frustrating things and here's the helpful things. That's a mixed bag of all of all of that. Sometimes what a person needs is just to say, well, just do it. You know, don't worry about how to do it. Just go do it. You can do it. And sometimes it's just what they need. And other times that frustrates them to no end. So when you're talking to 100 people or then later on the Internet, you're talking to, you know, 50,000 people. It's uh, it's a mix of what you say and how many people you frustrate, and how many people you illuminate and you know, how many people you encourage and how many people you discourage. It's hard to say, but you try to somehow hit that happy medium where you do the most good and have the lowest entropy possible for all the people who are going to listen. I think it's safe so. to say that you have been doing a great job because of all the followers and all the love that you pour into the MBT community. So thank yeah. you so much, Tom. You're welcome, Andy. I, uh, thanks for bringing us all together and, and, uh, and uh, talking about Tom Spark. That's a good thing. You know, a lot of people don't know it exists. So maybe this will help other people understand a little bit about what it is. What? A $79 book? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I could buy, I could buy five books for that, you know, I can see, but people need to understand, you know, what it is and what it can do and if they're ready for it. Not everybody's ready for it. You could hand it to some people and they would not be ready for it because they're convinced that anything that's in your imagination is junk. So, it's not for everybody, but for those who really can use it, I think it's going to be a good tool, a fun tool, and a very successful tool. You just have to keep working at it until you find yourself there, until you start customizing it and making it your own. Would you come back and talk to us again? 
<laughs> of course. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, of course. And I want to thank uh, Nathan Rim for joining us as our co-interviewer today. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thanks, Andy, for inviting me. And thank you, Tom, for being here. This has been a total joy for me. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Until next time. Okay. So long. So long. To learn more about Time Out and NIMSA, go to nimsa.me. Join our social media and continue the conversation on Time Out for Humanity. Let us know what topics you would like us to cover.